Hello, this is a recording of Ralph Lee and Ted Grant's Lessons of Spain, which was the foreword to Leon Trotsky's The Lessons of Spain, The Last Warning, and was written between May to June in 1938. Under the transparent disguise of the Peace Alliance agitation, the popular front of Britain now makes its first steps towards entering the political arena. The Liberals cock their ears attentively, the Labour Party heads strenuously oppose the project, and the Communist Party, the initiator of this agitation, is utilising every resource it possesses to bring the popular front into being. It now becomes urgently necessary for the British workers to draw conclusions from the events in Spain. To examine the experience of popular frontism as it appears in practice in the Civil War, in order to face up to the problems of tomorrow. Leon Trotsky, in a series of articles and pamphlets on the Spanish situation, has consistently pointed the road which the Spanish masses must travel if fascism is to be conquered, and has called insistently for the only guide along that road, the Revolutionary Workers' Party, to take up the position at the head of the awakening Spanish masses. Trotsky concludes his pamphlet, The Revolution in Spain, written in 1931, with these words, For a successful solution of all these tasks, Three conditions are required. A party, once more a party, again a party. The condition for a worker's victory over reaction, thus epigrammatically summed up, are still unfulfilled. This is the lesson that must be brought to the consciousness of the working class in Britain as in Spain. While the Spanish fascists openly prepared, with aid from abroad, to strike their blow, the popular front government conspicuously failed to make that counter preparation that would have destroyed the enemy swiftly and easily. The army was left undisturbed in the hands of the reactionaries. Under the noses of the popular front government, they consolidated a powerful basis among the Moors, who, finding the chains of the new government no less galling than those in the monarchy, fell an easy prey to Franco's specious promises. On the other hand, the workers were prevented by their reformist leaders from taking those measures that would have frustrated the fascist plans, the setting up of workers' militias and factory committees. When in spite of the entreaties of their leaders, who begged them not to provoke the reaction not to antagonise their Republican capitalist partners in the popular front, the workers struck and the peasants seized land. The government answered by arresting strikers, breaking up workers' meetings, censoring workers' papers, shooting down peasants. Such is the story related by the press dispatches and the official communications in the months of the popular front power leading up to the civil war. In this way, the popular front in the months preceding Franco's uprising gagged and tied the masses and drove numbers into the opposite camp, to join the Moors in opposing a democratic government that perpetuated their misery and oppression. Neither the Popular Front nor any other capitalist government could solve the basic problems of modern Spain. Five million peasant families with insufficient land, three million of them with no land at all, were squeezed by taxation and were starving. Only the expropriation of the big landowners and the redivision of the land among the poor peasants could relieve their famine. But the solution was impossible under capitalism, because the whole structure of the Spanish banking rests on the land mortgages, so that the ruin of the big landowners would mean the ruin of the capitalists and bankers. Only a Spanish October could, by dealing a death blow to the capitalist and landowning classes, alike relieve the hunger of the perishing masses in the countryside. The conditions of the workers in the cities likewise presented a problem insoluble under capitalism. Spanish industry, born too late to compete with the cheap goods which a well-developed foreign industry is able to pour into the jealously guarded market, is unable to even find a home market because of the impoverished peasant population. Marx and Lenin taught that there is no way out for the workers from their position of meagre wages and growing unemployment except by smashing down the barriers of capitalism and placing the control of the industry into the hands of the working class. In the first months of the Spanish Civil War, the workers of Spain spontaneously sought this way out of the essential part of their struggle against reaction, for it is not by military method alone that Franco can be defeated. Measures necessary to the rout the masses by giving them something to fight for were put into operation. Factory, village and shop councils and workers' tri- tribunals were set up. A workers' police force and militia were initiated. The beginnings of a workers' state thus came into being to conduct a revolutionary war against the fascists and existed side by side with the popular front, challenging its authority and wrestling away its functions. The communist and socialist parties came to the rescue of the capitalist government thus threatened with extinction. The end of the popular front government and Calvero, hailed as the Spanish Lenin, became the prime minister. Step by step, the conquests of the workers were flinched back in the name of the defense of democracy. The workers' militia was dissolved into the Republicans' army. Workers' courts were eliminated. Workers' police corps were disbanded. The same process went on in Catalonia, where the Palm entered the coalition government, proclaiming it the workers' government. But the Palm also proclaimed that the civil war was fundamentally a question of socialism versus capitalism, 
a truth which undermines the very foundations of the Popular Front. Republicans and Stalinists are united in a vile campaign of calumny against the POWM, accusing it of being in the pay of Franco, driving it from the government and suppressing its propaganda in journals, arresting and imprisoning its leaders. At the beginning of May 1937, the government launched its provocative attack on the workers to regain possession of the factories and buildings which were under workers' control. The resistance of workers was overcome and full control was regained by the bourgeoisie in the economic as in the political and military fields. The alternative that confronts the Spanish masses today are on one hand the victory of Franco initiating a totalitarian regime, or on the other hand the now problematic victory of the democratic capitalist regime, which in spent and devastated Spain can only rule by a scarcely veiled dictatorship. In either case, the chains will be more securely riveted on the limbs of the workers, peasants and the colonial people, exhausted and cheated. From its very inception, the Popular Front disavowed in its programme not only socialist, but even semi-socialist measures. It was openly and admittedly the guardian of capitalist property, dangling grandiose plans for future reforms before the eyes of the people to distract their attention from present miseries. The projected Popular Front in Britain is cut on the same pattern. Any idea of real socialism would have to be put aside for the present, declared Sir Stafford Cripps in the Tribune, April 14th, 1938. In pleading for a democratic front government, the Daily Worker supports the Liberal candidate in a by-election against the Labour candidate and sneered at Labour's astonishing discovery that Liberals are not socialists as if Liberals had ever made this claim. May 11th, 1938. For Britain as for Spain, the struggle against fascism is the struggle for socialism. The arms plans and the food plans the spy scares and the air raid precautions serve to warn the, the workers that the peace period draws rapidly to a close. The American recession industry spreads to Britain. In the first three months of 1938, the decline of new capital issues, 33 million against 49,505 million of the for the corresponding period last year, indicates the dimensions of the coming industrial slump. The increased employment in the armaments industry and the increased recruitment for the army serves for the time being to mask the growth of industrial unemployment and the shifting center of gravity in the national economy is not visible in the general statistics of trade and industry because the artificial stimulus of war preparations helps to conceal the real processes of economic breakdown. The disease that grips the vitals of capitalism in decay produces as a symptom a feverish activity in certain branches of industrial activity accompanied by the false sense of well-being that must be recognized as pre-war prosperity the delirium before the crisis. As long as the pre-war boom continues and the British masses continue in a comparatively passive state, the right-wing bureaucrats of the trade unions and the Labour Party oppose the Popular Front. When the masses start to move, as they did in Spain and France, towards a militant socialist solution of their difficulties, the Labour bureaucracy will not scruple to follow the example of its counterparts in Spain and France to put a bridle on the mass movement and lead it into safe bypaths of Popular Frontism. If today they resist the Popular Front, it is not only because it is the open, treacherous abandonment of even the pretense of socialism, but because they are quite satisfied with their own status in capitalist society, because they fear the inevitable exposure to which will take of political power will subject them. Today they attack the Liberals as non-socialists, tomorrow they will justify and defend them, and work hand in hand with them in the strike-baking conspiracy of the Popular Front, as their brother reformists of the Communist Party are already doing. The Communist Party of Great Britain pleads for the Popular Front and supports the Liberals on the programme of arms to Spain, defence of democratic liberties, economic and social advancement of the people. The French Popular Front in power supplied no arms for Spain. The French colonial slaves of North Africa and Indochina received as their share of democratic liberties, bullets and prison sentences. The French Popular Front government nibbled at the concessions wrestled from the ruling class by the direct strike action of the French workers and frustrated their wage gains by currency manipulation. The liberals and progressive capitalists offered, in place of reforms, grand delinquent plans for reforms. The past struggles of the Communist Party's leaders prove that they are well aware of the treacherous role of the liberals. Today, they are able to exploit the reputation for militancy which was won by the work of party members in the trade union struggle in order to lead militant workers along the political path mapped out by their paymasters in the Kremlin. Stalin and company are prepared to sacrifice the socialist aspirations of the British working class for the sake of a war alliance with the British bourgeoisie and to this end have ordered a popular front in Britain. The Communist Party has leaped to obey. They flatly and brazenly contradict their arguments of a few months back. 
They consciously and deliberately manoeuvre the workers into supporting a coalition government with a class enemy. They blindfold the worker while the liberals prepare the dagger which will be plunged into his back. The Communist Party carries out its traitorous works with loud cries of unity, unity, but the British working class constitutes itself two-thirds of the population and would draw behind itself the majority of the lower middle class if it was ever pressed forward with a bold programme for socialist demands. The workers have no need for alliance with any section of the class flow, least of all with the decayed, long-bankrupt liberals. They instinctively know that unity is an all-powerful weapon in their struggle. Unity of the working class. The popular front is a caricature of unity. The genuine united front on a class basis, binding together with the workers, their organisations, their parties on a programme of common struggle, is the crying need of today. The only means of defending these rights and privileges which the workers have won in generations of struggle and sacrifice. The successful descents of concessions already gained must inevitably lead to the campaign for full workers' right, to, to the struggle for workers' power. The experience of Spain is a warning and a lesson to the workers of the world, above all the British workers. Yesterday's drama in Spain is being rehearsed today in Britain. Tomorrow it will be enacted if the British workers have failed to realise the nature of the tax of which history has placed before them. And in preparing to tackle these tasks, the working class has need of above all of a party, once more a party, again a party.